The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Tuesday, September 15th, 2015. Hello everyone and welcome to a pre-recorded eBible Fellowship's questions and answers time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre-recorded questions and answers time, and say hello to Chris McCann. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Tuesday night question and answer program. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have. Each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways that were just mentioned and we'll be glad to take your call and I'll try to respond by going to the Bible as the Bible is God's holy word and it is there that we find our answers if if the Lord is pleased to open up our eyes to open up our understanding to them well uh, we have a short time together uh, tonight so we're we're going to get started uh, Get going right away by going to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, hi, Chris. One of the reasons that the churches love to hold the position that the Lord's return will be as a thief in the night, and they're still holding that position, is because they think that a thief in the night only pertains to an unexpected visit. They forgot that Jesus also said in John 10:10, 10, 10, a thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So that's a terrible position to hold. Nor do they realize that when they say peace and safety, feeling safe holding the thief in the night position, unseen destruction will come upon them. And it already has for those who weren't watching on for Judgment Day before May 21, 2011, with all the proofs from the Bible that the Bible gave us. And I'll take your comment, Chris. Well, uh, you know, it, it is true that the churches have instructed their members. And today the churches don't do um, hardly anything right. We, we know that because uh, the Spirit of God is not with them. And and so they're... Uh, they're uh, off their, their doctrine is off on practically every every point and it's off on this too but on other points of doctrine uh, baptism salvation uh, just about anything else you can think of there's a variety typically of errors that is um, sometimes they even get a teaching correct um, uh, a couple of church will, uh, or or a denomination will get something right, and and they don't agree on anything. In other words, between the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and the Catholics and the Lutherans, and and denomination after denomination, they're all split from one another. They're different denominations because of doctrinal differences typically in the past that set them on the course to be Baptists or or set them on the course of pres, uh, uh, Presbyterian, uh, the pres, uh, pre, uh, that, that's an elder, uh, presbuteros in, in the Greek, and and so they they have a high regard for elders and and there's there's always been differences the church has never spoke with a single voice on practically anything until May 21, 2011 came along. And then suddenly, suddenly all over the world, in every church, there is unity finally, unity where they speak with the same voice. And every church will say, no man knows. It, it has been 
in, uh, drilled into the members of all the world's churches today. No matter where we reach out um, and and uh, with the, the information about October 7th, uh, the likely day for the end of the world, there arises Pentecostals, Catholics, um, Lutherans, Presbyterians, of every denomination, and they all say the same thing. They say, no man knows, and the second most popular thing is Christ is coming as a thief. He's coming as a thief in the night. <clears throat> and by that, they, they've been instructed. That means you cannot know because um, they, they, they like to say, a thief doesn't tell you when he's coming. And they, they uh, fail to realize that their church, their church has indoctrinated them into the mindset of the world and they have indoctrinated them to behave themselves to hold a belief that um, it is uh, a belief uh, that that you must be in ignorance that you cannot know information from the scriptures it it's a teaching of you you will be in ignorance you'll you'll have no knowledge of the coming of Christ you will not know when he comes and they have been trained to behave themselves as unsafe people in this matter and it's fitting because we know the church is full of unsafe people that God has separated the wheat and the tares and 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 so uh, they're giving evidence of their unsaved condition. They they uh, don't want Christ to come. In actuality, they don't want the world to end. We hear that again and again. They they love the world. They love the things of the world, and therefore, this teaching is widely accepted in all churches because it. It gives them an excuse not to pay any attention to these things, and they don't have to look for and haste unto the coming day of God. They can just give lip service to the whole thing and say, well, uh, Jesus, uh, don't put a date. Jesus, though, could come today or tomorrow or the next day, and you always have to be ready. That's what they say. 30 seconds later, they that's out of mind. The coming of Christ is not any longer considered. And now you can't distinguish somebody in the church from somebody in the world. They behave the same way. They speak the same way. They love the same music and so forth. It, they're, they're indistinguishable because the world is the church and the church is the world. But here here's what... Uh, God says, and this is a verse that anybody can read in any church. Any pastor could find this verse, and, and any pastor, um, you know, if someone says they're a pastor or a teacher or an elder, and they're teaching their, their congregation, Christ comes as a thief in the night, and that means you cannot know, well, you would expect them to have first looked up every place the word thief is found and and to check it out, the, to examine it, and to see what the Bible says about a thief. And in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, it says in verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, and that's what they said. Okay, so, so far, it's, it's correct. Yes, Christ is coming as a thief in the night. Then in verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But here is the verse that churches do not teach on. 
they do not instruct their members about. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 4, in the context of Christ coming as a thief, it says, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Brethren, God is addressing the elect. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day overtake you as a thief. Now, that's, that's uh, giving a lot of information. Christ comes as a thief in the night. True. However, God is saying, not for you, brethren, not for you, not for the elect, because you're not in darkness. And this goes along with what you just quoted in John 10. Let's go over there. In, in John 10, it says in verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is, when Christ comes as a thief, he's coming as the judge of the world to punish the sinner. He's coming for the ones in darkness, in, in spiritual darkness, and when he comes, he will steal their treasure, he will kill them, he will destroy them. And therefore, when the church teaches its people, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night for you. He is, the, the, the church is teaching its people. They are unsaved. They are in darkness. Christ is coming to destroy them. And, and that's a horrible thing. It happens to be accurate at this time because of God's separation of the wheat and the tares and God's judgment upon the churches and that they've been bundled as tares for the burning. But it, 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 they've been teaching their members this uh, previously in the days of the Great Tribulation when they could have done something about it, when, when it was still possible at that point uh, they they could have uh, told the people the truth. No, no, it, it's for the unsaved Jesus comes as a thief in the night. Not for you, brethren. Here it is right here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. And more than that, go over to Revelation 3. In Revelation 3. And here, God um, ties together the idea of no man knows with a thief in the night. In Revelation 3, verse, um, verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, and Jesus has repeated that again and again in the gospel accounts, Watch, therefore. Keep watch. And the church says, oh, yes, we're watching for Christ's coming. Really? By telling your congregation, no man knows, and he's coming as a thief, and, and uh, as further evidence, no man knows. That's like saying, go ahead up in the watchtower, but before you get up there, make sure you're wearing your blindfold. Make sure you're, you're wearing your blinder so you can't see anything. And here's a trumpet. But make sure when you climb up into the watchtower wearing your blindfold that you never blow that trumpet because you can never see him coming, uh, you, you see. But we have to watch. So get up there. Get up into the watchtower. And, and actually, let's, let's take out the device that allows the trumpet to blow. Here's a trumpet that doesn't blow. And put on your blindfold and get up in the watchtower to, to sound the warning alarm when Christ comes, which you can never see or know anything about. Uh, that is the foolishness, the blindness, the dumbness that God has struck 
the unsaved in the congregations with that they have developed this ridiculous uh, erroneous teaching that that we're watchmen uh, but we're blind watchmen uh, uh, and God mocks that idea in the book of Isaiah he says their watchmen are like dumb dogs that cannot bark it, can you imagine if you you put a, a dog in your junkyard or you own a junkyard and you know how they have junkyard dogs to protect it and and you put dogs that can't bark the, you what good is it to to prevent the the ones who are going to to break into your junkyard if your dogs can't bark and what good is a watchdog or a watchman who cannot um, when he sees the sword coming blow the trumpet to warn the people and and that's uh, the failure of the church it was the failure of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5 when they were holding a party and, and celebrating drinking in the vessels of the house of God and there was an enemy army right outside their gates they didn't know anything about it they, they had no clue the, the 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 king of Babylon was calling for Daniel uh, to uh, to reward him and and to lift him up and Daniel said keep it because Daniel knew that, uh, that he wasn't in darkness uh, he knew that what was happening because God warned him Daniel could read the writing on the wall it was only the Babylonians who couldn't and the king of Babylon who couldn't and then Cyrus came like a thief in the night and took the kingdom. Where were their watchmen? Where were the church's watchmen on May 21, 2011? Nowhere to be found because the church's doctrines, they, they handcuffed them and made them blind. They, they had no ability. Well, here God says in Revelation 3:3, 3, 3, if therefore thou shalt not watch, and the church did not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. You know, the church failed twice. First, Christ came as a thief upon the congregations to remove the candlestick. When God began judgment at the house of God, then they heard about the the day of judgment, May 21, 2011, and, and they were ignorant of that also. And because they did not watch, Christ came as a thief. Because they did not watch, they did not know the day and hour. Now, what's the implication of Revelation 3.3? 3? What if you do watch? What is that verse telling us if you do watch. It's telling us uh, what happens if you don't watch. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, Christ comes as a thief. You don't know the day or hour. What would be the result if someone did watch? The implication is clear and direct. If you watch, he will not come as a thief. You will know the day and hour you you will have understanding if you watch that's what's implied in revelation 3 3 well when we put all these verses together we we see that uh it, it's really a terrible thing it's a terrible thing but it was it, it was by the allowance of god god permitted the church to hold on to these um, these erroneous teachings uh, in order to strike them with blindness because it was God's plan that they not understand. Remember, that's what Jesus said concerning parables. To you it is given, he said to um, the disciples, the elect, to know the mysteries or to see them of the kingdom of heaven. But to, the, to them it's not given. It's not given, and therefore, uh, uh, let's see what it says there in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 
and um, verse 11, he answered when the question was, why do you speak in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And then in um, verse 13, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. See, God, it, 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 he's saying, uh, look, uh, I, they can't have understanding because they're not elect, and if they had understanding, then it, it would be as though they would become saved, and that can't, that's not possible because they're not elect. Therefore, in keeping with their, uh, the fact that they were never chosen from the foundation of the world, I will, I will uh, uh, not bring them to understanding or into the light. They'll stay in darkness, and their eyes will remain closed. And, and that's the situation with the church today. But thank you for uh, bringing up that verse and, and uh, that topic. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Could you please read Joshua 3, verses 7 and 8, and Joshua three seventeen? Excuse me, Joshua 3, 7 and 8? Yeah. Okay. Um, and Jehovah said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee, in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And what's the other verse? Verse 17. Same chapter? Yes. Okay. Uh, Joshua 3.17. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, <clears throat> and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over. Yes. Could you explain um, God allowing only the priests to stand firm on the dry ground so all the people were passed? Well, the, the priests were uh, carrying the ark. And, and remember, uh, God stipulated that when the ark was moved, it, it had to be Levites that, that would carry it. And the priests would have been of the tribe of, of Levi. And th there was a, a fault one time when the ark was being moved and and it was being transported by people who weren't Levites, and God struck, um, uh, I forget his name, but he struck a man dead. And, and so the, the Levites were called upon to carry the ark. The ark typified the presence of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so the, it's really the, the great significant thing is the ark, um, is the one that that enters into the Jordan uh, it, the priests when their feet touched the Jordan then then uh, the waters began to stay and and the dry uh, pathway opened up but that was because of the presence of the ark and uh, th there there's um, a verse that that tells us uh, that this, this crossing of Jordan, that uh, the the ark went. 
um, or, or the people followed behind about 2,000 cubits. Um, the, there's oh, there's yeah, a that statement like that somewhere here in Joshua. That, that first yeah. the ark entered the River Jordan, and then the people were about 2,000 cubits behind, and then they crossed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Mr. Camping, uh, I think, had a good explanation for that years ago where he pointed out that the ark typified Christ going, and when Jesus went into the River Jordan, the, the River Jordan was a picture of the wrath of God. And, and, and so Christ died for sins from the foundation of the world, but then he entered into the world in um, 7 BC. He was born, and he died in 33 AD. And, and, and so he experienced the wrath of God a second time at that point in 33 AD. Uh, and, and, and so from Christ's experience of the wrath of God, and this would probably help to explain the presence of the Levites or the priests, uh, because when Jesus died at the foundation of the world, he was bearing the sins of his people, and we were in that sense with him or in him uh, as we were baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with and and baptism is the washing away of sin and 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 sin was washed away by the wrath of god by the the fiery wrath of god purging it through through punishing christ with death at the foundation of the world, and then Jesus demonstrated that at the cross, and and so we, in a sense, were in him, and that would explain the priest bearing the ark. And, and then about 2,000 cubits behind come all Israel, and it is now the year 2015 A.D. Jesus was sacrificed in 33 A.D., so, so he, uh, in in that this historical figure, he entered Jordan or or went through the wrath of God. Now, from our present time, about two thousand years ago, and 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 now we're coming to the River Jordan, and and it's open. We ourselves do not have to go through the wrath of God or experience the wrath of God to cross over to the promised land because Jesus is the one who took that wrath upon himself in our place. So it's all a dry riverbed to us, not a drop, not a drop of water will touch us of the wrath of God. We come behind and cross over. And, and that's why... Uh, another reason we're looking with good expectation to um, October 7th, 2015. It's about 2,000 years since Christ went to the cross, typified by the about 2,000 cubits of distance between the ark entering the River Jordan and then the people of Israel um, following behind. And that's also another example of a measurement cubits that would typify time as the about 2,000 cubits would relate to about 2,000 years that there a cubit would relate to a year. Now we're looking at a measurement of furlongs to represent days, but, but God, you know, in the Bible, we've seen that baskets in Genesis, represent time, stalks of corn, um, uh, baskets, three baskets represent three days, seven stalks of corn represent seven years in, in Joseph's dream. And the cubits here uh, in this account, historical account of 2000, about 2000, and it's very carefully said about, not exactly 2000, then we would look to 2033 AD, but about because God is so precise, and 2015 is not exactly 2,000 years, but it certainly is about 2,000 years. 
But thank you. Thank you. For bringing up those verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Tuesday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Well, it looks like we, we lost that caller, so let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on something. Um, you know, as we've discussed many times that, um, you know, hell is not a literal place, and therefore when God destroys everything, the, the sinners will be consumed also. Um, I have a thought to add to that, and I want to see if you agree with agree with it. Um, when you know the law is broken in this world, we have to, uh, and we want to challenge it. We'd have to appear in the place in which the law was broken. Being that all sin is committed in this world where the law is broken, therefore, as an uh, as an additional proof, I guess you would say. There's another reason why judgment has to occur in this world is because that's where the sin and the inf- and the and the disobedience and the breaking of the law has taken place. Would you agree with that? Um, well, it, it it sounds correct, but um, I, I it's just a thought. yeah. I, I never look at it that way. Um, it, I I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be correct. Okay, no, I just, I just, I just thought if you could, if you could, I don't know if you can comment on it. Like I said, it was just a thought that I have. I, I hope I'm not reaching too far when I say that. Well, we, you know, when, when, when God speaks of judging, uh, we know, we, we used to have an idea, but there was really never any uh, biblical evidence for it. The idea used to be, and I'm talking years ago now, Christ comes, the world's destroyed, and then all the unsaved are sort of metaphysically appearing before God. And they're they're like in in uh, on the clouds almost. Uh, Here's here's God on his judgment throne, and here's all the elect. That have been raptured and resurrected and and they all have their glorified bodies as the jury we're we're behind god or beside god and and all the unsaved are before him and now uh, the the world's gone and now that everyone comes to be sentenced and this our idea used to be you're guilty and and off into hell a place God would create at that point, and and there you will suffer forevermore. And we we know that everything with that whole scenario has been wrong. Everything about it that that God does not judge man after He destroys the world, but He judges man uh, while the world is still here. We we know this from. The Bible locking in May 21, 2011. We know it from um, just scriptures like Revelation 14 that that says um, um, God is pouring out the cup of his wrath in the presence of the holy angels. That's the messengers in the presence of the Lamb. And in that context, he says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, why would the saints need patience if if it was our former understanding? Everyone is in glory, and and now it's just a matter of carrying out the final uh, punishment, the destruction, and God's going to handle that. Why would the saints need any sort of patience? But the reason is we know we see this crystal clear today. We definitely have needed patience when the situation was judgment day begins on May 21, 2011, a spiritual judgment that 
those under the weight of the judgment do not even see. And, and here are God's people left on the earth in the time of judgment. And God opens their eyes to understand he's judging the world. And, and so uh, without patience, and patience is related to waiting on God, it's related to tribulation, experiencing a trial and test, and faithfully enduring while waiting on God, uh, then you lose your soul. Without in patience possess ye your soul. We also know, and I don't know of any, any um, theologian or of anybody that can explain this verse who who teaches uh, of, of a place of hell with eternal torment, uh, who, who would have the understanding Christ is coming on the last day. Well, and, and then he'll take his people and destroy the world. Okay, well, how do you explain Isaiah 24, verse 6? And the whole chapter of Isaiah 24, God keeps saying the earth, the earth in verse 4, mourneth and fadeth away. Um, the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth, verse 5, also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate, Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. The inhabitants of the earth, not many, not most, but the inhabitants of the earth are burned. All the wicked people are burned. And the, the entire chapter is going verse after verse after verse, speaking of, Judgment Day. It, there, there, it doesn't fit a judgment on the church in any way because God keeps saying earth. I think at least 15 times or more. Earth, earth, earth. Uh, it, it, it's, it cannot apply to the judgment on the church. It must apply to the judgment on the earth. Just as it says, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. And when are the inhabitants of the earth burned? When judgment day comes. Okay, well, the inhabitants of the, the earth are burned, but then it says at the end of verse 6 of Isaiah 24, and few men left. Few men left. And, and uh, th this, th this means that the some sort of burning or fire was put to all the inhabitants of the earth, everyone who is on the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth were burned, yet somehow a few men were left, or a few men went through the fire, they endured the fire, a few men remained they remained at the the end of this burning that that's the only way we can understand this statement and who are these few men and how could everyone else be burned why would everyone else be burned and these few men left the uh, when when the earth the earth the earth is under the judgment of god and the only explanation is is what we have lived through what we we can now uh, we can read this verse uh, as mr camping used to say like the daily newspaper it's as clear as day that oh of course a spiritual burning a spiritual fire 
was put to all the inhabitants of the earth, but it burned up the vast majority because the vast majority are unsaved. But it did not burn up the few. And, and then we, to define the few, we search the Bible. Many are called, few are chosen. The few are God's elect. The few that remain, that go through the burning, are God's elect. And, and then uh, we, we compare this with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we start seeing how uh, God's day of judgment unfolds and, and God's righteous, uh, the righteous revelation of his, of his judgment. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says uh, in verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Gold, silver, precious stones typify the elect, wood, hay, stubble, the non-elect, the unsaved. Then it says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. And to be made manifest means it'll be revealed. It, it'll be proved that we're, we're going to find out <clears throat> who's truly saved and who isn't. For the day shall declare it. What day is that? What day is going to declare every man's work? Well, we again search the Bible, and the only answer is judgment day, the day of the Lord. That will declare it. And, and yes, okay, and, and what, what is the characteristic of the day of the Lord? Fire. The wrath of God is typified by fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Well, here it says the day shall declare it because it shall it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That that matches perfectly with what we just read in Isaiah 24, verse 6. The earth is, all the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. And, and that is the day that reveals what you're made of, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, because a fire is, is going to try every man's work to see what it is. And... And then it says in verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now, what does it mean to abide? It means to, to endure, to be left. You, you weren't burned. Uh, you know, just picture um, sort of like an incinerator. Uh, that uh, where maybe where they cremate people and and it, it's a, a intense flame and and yet there's some sort of conveyor and and so things uh, move along through the fire and and let's say there's a door on the other side so everything is incinerated by the fire and then uh, out the other side would come the conveyor with whatever is left. And, and, and if what God has done is May 21, 2011 began Judgment Day, the spiritual fire, the burning of all the inhabitants of the earth. And the unsaved are burned to destruction. That They're punished. They haven't been destroyed or annihilated as yet because that occurs on the last day. But spiritually... They've already been burned, and, and uh, their, their eternal fate has been established. But the elect, the few, are, are burned with them because we remain living on the earth to go through the day of judgment. 
and the fire has been put to us and we have felt it, we have certainly felt it, experienced it. That's why so many have been troubled and afflicted and we, we know we've been severely tested. As it says here in 1 Corinthians 3, the fire shall try every man's work. We have been under a fiery trial of faith. As it says in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, in the context, it leads right up to judgment begins at the house of God. And that's really when God began severely trying people to be beginning of the great tribulation. But in 1 Peter 4, uh, 4 verse 12, it says, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So here God says, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial. Now the the two English words, fiery trial, are only translated here in this verse as fiery trial. It's Strong's number 4451, and it's translated as burning in the book of Revelation concerning the fall of Babylon. When, when Babylon is burning, it's this word that's translated fiery trial. So here God's saying, Beloved, who would be the elect, think it not strange concerning the burning, which is to try you. And when will you burn? When Babylon falls, Babylon fall, fell historically at the end of 70 years, which typified the end of the Great Tribulation. And when did the actual Great Tribulation conclude? May 21, 2011. Babylon fell. Satan's kingdom fell. And the burning began in earnest for all the inhabitants of the earth. And, and this is what we have been experiencing, what God's people have been enduring. Uh, you know, we, we saw in the book of Daniel, uh, and, and that was a picture of the Great Tribulation, not this Judgment Day, when, uh, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, you know, I, I uh, always kind of smile when I say uh, Abednego because I used to say that to my kids when it was time to put them to bed. Uh, I, I would say, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed you go. But, but when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow the knee to the king of Babylon, they were cast into a, a burning, fiery furnace that was heated seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And, and yet they endured the flame because within that fire was one like unto the Son of Man. And, and there God was illustrating that and again that's when the lord did begin to severely try people the beginning of the great tribulation but but what happened with shadrach meshach and abednego was a historical picture that perfectly describes what has happened to all of god's people since we've entered into this final phase this in this we in the fire but even though we've been tried and, and uh, greatly tried, yet when we come out of the fire, and there will be a coming out of the fire, there will not be uh, a hair of our head that was singed. The smoke of burning will not be found on us. We, it, we will not be harmed in the slightest bit because God has found no fault within us. We have come before his judgment throne, and we all must appear, be made manifest before the throne of Christ, and, and God 
has brought us through the judgment along with everyone else only to finally declare as Pilate declared of the Lord Jesus Christ, I find no fault in this man. God will find no fault in his elect and we will be um, we'll be as purified gold and silver. We will have come through the day will declare and reveal that we are God's true people, that we are born again. Our sins have been washed away, and not one remains, or else we would have been destroyed in the fire. And, and so it'll be the day of glory, the lifting up. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And um, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time tonight. Uh, Lord willing, we will um, gather together again tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m., the same time, Eastern time, and, uh, and go to about 10 to 10.30. Um, also, in the day on Facebook, all are welcome to join our Facebook Sunday Q&A group uh, that, that uh, meets 12 to about 1 p.m. each day. But for now... May you have a good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and Monday through Friday evenings following the Monday through Friday studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.